bunch of these uh, things. The recording started right now. I finished the recording and upload uh, the video to YouTube and to get you the link. Uh, let me do some settings here. So uh, before I start, I'd like to ask a few questions. How you are comfortable with the way the lecturing is going on? Someone must admit. And again, I'm seeing students who are joining using their personal email addresses. Uh, please use your SQ email addresses. Maybe I sometimes depend on these uh, attendance, the one I'm using, or there is an extension to Google Comps, which lets me to record who is attending the lectures. So if you attend using your personal email, I might, uh, I might not recognize your name. So assume that you are not presenting. Uh, anyway, back to the lectures, uh, I would like to ask a few questions. How you are comfortable with the way lecturing is going on? I was a bit busy the last two weeks or the last week specifically. I couldn't perform much and I couldn't be in contact with you throughout the week. However, the lectures, the slides, everything is available. My recommendation is that you first read the uh, the book itself. Reading is very important. You have to read something. If you don't read the book, read something else. Uh, I did my master degree and my PhD degree abroad, not in Oman, not in Eskiyo specifically. So there, uh, usually, they don't even give a students a book. Neither they give them some material. There is usually no uh, any outlines or out uh, slides notes. So the students are requested to go and search for books, search for some material, and there is not one book, more than one book, usually three to four books. Is, and they are not usually available the way you have them here. You can go to the bookstore here in our college and get the book. Mr. I want to ask you, uh, we follow the slides of the book. I follow the slides. I get you questions for the exam in the slides. Another thing, so when I don't have to see the book. Hey, it's for your benefit. You have to read the book. Sometimes, when I explain something, you'll mm. find that uh, the slides are not sufficient. Could you turn okay, off I'm your? Yeah, please turn off, uh, once you finish talking, turn off your mic. I don't hear my echo. I'm hearing myself because your uh, mic is also on. So I depend usually on the slides, the exams, uh, everything, the quizzes are from the slides. But they are also sometimes from what I say during the lecture, my, my lecturing. So if you miss something, you might don't understand the question in the exam. That's very important. I used to give some questions uh, last semester or the semester before. Um, they were not in the slides. Neither they were in the, in the book. But you will find that many things from now on, from today, from this uh, week onward, they are exactly as represented in the book. So books probably gives a better explanation than what I do. I try my best, I try to clarify all the things, make it easy for you, link things together, clarify any questions you have. But this is a learning process. You have to put some efforts. You are not in a school or a school degree. You are in a university degree doing ma or bachelor degree. So in this degree, you have almost to depend 70% on yourself rather than depending on me, on the instructor. So the last time, I believe we stopped somewhere visualization of our results, of our geophysical data. 
we as human see beauty like things in beautiful way represented in simple way not complicated way math complex equations might frighten you but simple things simple structures might attract you so once you finish your geological processing and geological modeling creating a model of the subsurface you have to make this model in simple way for the others to understand you are not showing things to yourself alone you are sharing your ideas your uh, results your models with your peer geologist as a geophysicist probably i don't understand many things for example in geological modeling or advanced geology or not sure what terminology i can bring but there are some courses in facies doing facies i haven't studied these things so you whenever someone from that discipline facies doing facies analysis whenever he talks to me i would like him to talk in simple manner in an understandable language in simple language for me for the rest to understand you know uh this is something really bad in in arab world especially i was i was in a meeting yesterday or day after yesterday and the whole the meeting was uh, about there were two two persons influencers are they influencers in social media or not but the whole topic or half of the discussion was about them <laughs> and it was a waste of time but in countries like, I give you a simple example, Iran. Iran is uh, is not a developed country, but uh, they have something unique. Whenever there is a discussion, a scientific discussion, uh, they emphasize that this discussion is supposed to be in their own language, in Persian language. Why? For the community to understand, for the message to be delivered to as much people as possible. Let me switch off my phone. getting annoyed because of these messages sorry about that uh, whereas here in Oman um, we deliver most of the uh, scientific uh, meeting or conferences in English the English is the only language and the majority of people here maybe a lot of people know English but this is not their uh, mother tongue uh, this the same thing here applies to something similar to what we were saying uh, whenever you try to dis uh, share your knowledge uh, discuss with others make it in simple way so we like to share our results with geologists give get insights from them and make your visualization in simple way for example what you see here might be quite complex for geologists, for petroleum engineers, or even people from the agriculture. This is basically a model, a porosity model of the year. The color scale is showing how much the porosity is changing. We are all interested on the porosity of rocks because the poor, poor uh, of, the, of the rock, they contain fluids. It's the poor which contains the fluid. So this is a simple representation, a 3D, X, Y, and Z representation of a model, an Earth model. And we are interested on the part which have highest porosity. So the highest porosity is probably this red below the blue one. Why I'm interested in that part? Because the blue is impermeable rock, is a trap rock, is a a rock which does not allow for the fluid to to go through so what's below that layer probably is a reservoir and that's true we see the the red color which is this one is of high porosity so this is the reservoir and the one the blue color above is the seal can geophysics bring such things yes geophysical analysis can tell you what is the porosity of the rock 3d seismic 3d seismic technique 
can give you some results about the porosity of the rocks. So we can bring such analysis in 3D sense. Here, another visualization, advanced visualization. This is actually 3D seismic. What is 3D seismic? We'll talk about this probably in week six or week seven. Uh, 3D seismic is something uh, shows you the layering of structures or layering of rocks. What you see here, for example, two, two sections. So this is one section, that's another section. It's actually a 3D volume. It's a 3D cube. I can slice through. I can take an inline, a line like in this direction, and I can take a perpendicular line. This is another line. This is one line. So what you see of change in color, in change, the change you see in color, they look like layered. They are looking like a layered. And those layering actually representing geological layers. Whenever you go to an outcrop driving nearby a mountain area, you'll find that there are some layering in the rock because those are sedimentary rocks actually. So the seismic techniques can give you something similar. The end product is amplitude variation. So this is amplitude, the color representing the amplitude variation. And what I'm seeing different layers. And here is a fault. You know what is a fault. So you see, this is a great thing about seismic reflection. This is seismic reflection. It's telling you the number, the layering of uh, rocks, whether there is a fault there or not. And here, what you see is a surface. This is actually a surface of a layer. And one layer, I mapped its surface. A layer or one rock is a rock deposited in a certain period of time. So the top of that layer might be traced, might be tracked in seismic data. You might ask, uh, whatever I said right now, it's not written here. No, it's, this slide is not that important. I'm just giving you an idea how you can visualize differently the geophysical data. So this is seismic data, 3D actually seismic data. Here is a different visualization. We have something called 4D seismic or 4D survey in, geophysic, in geophysics. What is 4D? 4D is anything where time is involved. If I do a geophysical survey in one place right now and do the same survey after two years or one year or different time later on, this is considered as 4D. And there is supposed to be a condition. The acquisition parameters you used in the base survey, in the base, in the first survey, they must be similar to the subsequent surveys, second survey, third survey you made in the same area. For example, here we have a field, a reservoir, which contains hydrocarbon. My first survey, geophysical survey, gave me some idea about the fluid content, about the hydrocarbon column, the content of the hydrocarbon in the reservoir. So you see the red area is quite large. It's thick because this is acquired, the seismic data here were acquired in 1975 before doing any pumping out, before doing extraction of the oil. Later after five years, once they produce a lot of amount of oil, they acquired again seismic data in 1980, exactly. And the seismic data showed them that the column of what uh, the column of hydrocarbon of oil decreased a lot. 
So this is how Seismic can help you uh, doing it in different years. Gives you an insight how much change was happening there in the reservoir rocks in terms of pressure change, in terms, for example, of a column of hydrocarbon. Maybe there is a compaction, a rock is compressing the the reservoir, the higher rock, or you are injecting something, you are changing even the porosity, which is something which cannot be changed easily, the porosity of the rock. Here we see another 4D model. It's small area, it's 1.3 meter by 1.3 meter, a very small area. And in the middle, there is a tree trunk. And here we are doing electrical resistivity survey. The electrical resistivity survey is useful for detecting water, where the water is within the rock, within the layers. So they started the irrigation system. They started watering the, the area. So my electrical survey showed me where the water front is in different snapshots of time. So they, they acquired how much, uh, how much survey they did? One, that's the first one. Second, third, fourth, fifth. Five different survey. This is a map view, X, Y view. This is a cross-sectional view. And uh, this axis is right now the depth. And you see this line is similar to the, to the, to the line, the cross-sectional line. So this line is the cross-sectional line. It's similar to taking a slice through the rock. So what we see, we see the water is going deeper and deeper each time. And this is a 3D of the volume of water, how it moved through. Quite fascinating. It's really interesting. So you have the time, you have an image where the waterfront is. Uh, you can work out with Archie equation and get out what's, for example, the porosity. What is also the permeability? What is the permeability of the soil, for example, in here? How fast the water is moving through the rocks? This is also a 4D. So I decrease, uh, maybe I forgot these slides. Yes, I forgot a few slides. So this is also a visualization, uh, different type of visualization. One of the most important type of visualization is contour, creating contour maps. This is the thing you study in geology one. Geologists, uh, many scientists, they like to see things in contoured. And especially when you color those contours, I can color them. Uh, the high contour, they give them one color. The low contours give them a different color. And I can show them in different formats. So this is uh, a 3D contour. And this is wireframe or isometric projection. The same map you see here, or the same contour you see in this area. This is a cross-sectional view of velocity. We do this in seismic refraction a lot. But this is type of display we use for seismic refraction. Here, the, the red color shows what the low velocity layers, whereas the blue color shows the high velocity layers. What is high velocity? This is how fast the seismic waves travels in rocks. When I make a disturbance in the rock, it travels from one point to another point. How fast it travels, it's what we call seismic velocities. So these are also some visualizations. Uh, this is seismic section, actually a 3D plot of seismic section. And in here, I'm showing where the actually the oil is contained. This is a surface map. The surface maps are actually created from seismic data. In oil companies, what they do, they do, uh, they get the seismic data. And for example, you see this blue color, 
strong blue color, they go pick it and they go by mouse, start picking it, pick, 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 try to trace it by mouse. And the final product is something like what you see here, what you see in this map, what we call as a surface map. For example, in petroleum, gel, petroleum engineering, uh, the first thing they will work with, work, is, work with is actually a map, a 3D map of the reservoir. They need to get what is the gross rock volume. What is the gross amount of rock below some point, they call it spell point. What spell point is the point from which the oil cannot escape. So it's 3D, you need to know how much volume of rock is this? How big is this rock is? Then you need to know the porosity. So how much, how much total percentage of porosity within this big rock is? You need to know the porosity. Seismic can help you. Or another thing you can use to get the porosity is well data. There is a well penetrating through the reservoir. It can give you at least some idea about the porosity. So knowing the porosity, you can then uh, know how much volume of pore fluid can be contained in these pores. Then you need to know amount of oil saturation or water saturation because those pores within the rock, they can either be filled with water or can be filled with hydrocarbon. So if we know water saturation, the remaining part within the pool is what is oil actually. If I know, if my rock, for example, is uh, in terms of volume, let's make a simple example, one, one kilometer cube. This is a simple example. If my rock volume is one kilometer cube, half of this rock, 50% is pores. The porosity is uh, quite high. 50% is pores. The remaining is matrix, is hard rock. So how much volume of the rock can be contained with fluid? 50%. Half, 0.5 meter cube or kilometer cube. Then if I know that, uh, let's say 30% um, of that volume, of the poor volume, 0.5. Someone is talking? Any questions? If I know, for example, 50% uh, is the porosity, I can work out, for example, the saturation, water saturation, and finally get what is the hydrocarbon content, the amount of hydrocarbon there. So if the amount of hydrocarbon is so high, you can drill. If it's not commercial, it's not so big, you will not drill. You will say that, uh, it's yani, it's not commercial. Seismic can help in this regards a lot. So these are seismic. Those maps actually uh, surface maps are generated from seismic data. So we in this chapter, this is the first chapter we finished. This is introduction chapter. Actually, I have to finish it uh, last week but we extended it a bit. Let's move to another chapter, a different chapter. We call it seismic or seismology in general. Once we finish this chapter, we'll move to seismic refraction next week. And the last part, we'll do some seismology, real seismology. So this is a new chapter, uh, chapter four actually in your book. So in this chapter, we'll talk about waves. What are waves? What is pools and ray? And we'll discuss how we can detect seismic waves. What is seismometers and what are geophones? Those are actually some instruments which can be used to record seismic waves.
and we'll discuss how we can find the ray path, how the wave travels within the rock. What is Snell's law? It's a governing equation which, uh, which can be used to infer how the wave is traveling in the rocks. What is the ray parameters and how we do ray tracing and find the velocity structure of the Earth? We'll discuss the various types of waves. Seismic wave is not one type. We have the, the, the normal waves we can discuss are four different waves. They can be categorized into two different waves. One of them is called body waves. Body waves consist of uh, P, compressional, and S wave. This, there are other waves within surface waves. Those two are Love Wave and Riley Wave. So we have four different wave type, types. We'll discuss later on what is Earth structure. And we'll see how seismic phases and travel times are calculated. And we'll do or show you what's exactly tomography. So what you see in this figure actually waves. The first figure is showing some waves generating from a point. They are moving in every direction and spherically they move in 3D. And whenever there is an interface or a change in medium, the wave will be uh, refracted. The wave is refracting. The wave can either move so this is the incident angle. The wave is moving. And the line, if I draw a line, this is the normal line. And that's what we call the incident angle. This is the uh, refraction angle. So it can either move toward the normal, toward this line, or away from the normal. The waves are basically vibrations. These are disturbances within the rock. They can be generated in different ways. They can be either generated by earthquakes or man-made. If I hammer the ground, I take a big hammer and hit the ground, I will generate waves. And the waves moves in the earth in an elastic manner. They will not usually uh, make a change in the rock. The rock either push or pull back. It's an elastic, similar to how you change a rubber. If you try to change extend the rubber, it moves back to its initial state. And the waves actually, they move in certain speed and certain direction. The wave will have a speed and direction. The wave basically is a movement of energy or propagation of energy in certain direction. These are all simple terminologies. I believe you have studied them in physics too, probably. So I'm just repeating some general knowledge to you. As I said, they move in an elastic medium. They are not changing the point of the particle. When there is a movement of a wave from one point to another point or a disturbance from one point to another point, the particle from one point will not travel a distance, a different distance, whereas it just push the particle nearby and you will image or your eye shows that there is a movement of the wave. So if I take this particle, you will see what's happening with this particle. It's almost in the same place. It's stationary. It's just pushing and pulling the particles nearby and making a disturbance. The disturbance itself is traveling. It's traveling at a certain speed. So whenever you find the particles squished together, you'll find, for example, these where my, where my pointer is. This is called compression. They are compressed. The particles are compressed together. 
whereas and the trailing part where the particle uh, usually at the distance apart from each other this is called a dilatation so this is a dilatation and compression this is a different wave type than the wave type you see here so the wave type you see here is quite different than the wave type you see in this side the wave here i'm seeing they are creating sinusoidal waves a wave similar what you see in like for example in water lakes it, they have trough and peak they have some trough and peak so i have for example these two different images i can for example how i can create a pulse or a change in this spring i can push it quickly or pull it very quickly in one direction and you'll find a compression is moving along this spring once it hits this wall it retains back so as i said behind the compression there is a dilatation It moves at a certain speed. I can also create a disturbance in a rope attached to a wall. The disturbance can be made when I raise suddenly, very quickly, the rope up. A trough will move along the rope. That's the trough. It's moving along the rope the direction along which the wave is moving we call wave propagation direction so this is a schematic diagram of some simple uh, two different wave types in spring this is a compression wave this is a shearing wave this is what we call a shearing wave whereas this is a compression wave what you can observe that the wave is also moving in time if i take certain amount of snapshots image of this motion in time very quick uh, snapshots you will find that certain time this is the position where the successive compression are this is a compression a compression but keeps moving in different snapshots time two up to time six same likewise similarly here i'm seeing a similar phenomenon however the type of wave is different than the wave type i'm seeing here so this is called a compressional wave or p wave whereas the one you see here is called a shear wave or s wave the wave direction right now is from left in my case from left from this hand to this hand that's how i'm seeing it it's moving in space the wave is moving in space and it's also moving in time so if it's moving in space at also in time it have a period and have also a wavelength what's wavelength is the distance between successive compressions or dilatation in the case of compressional wave or it's the distance between different two successive trough or two successive peaks so this is a peak whereas this is is a trough here I'm seeing a peak, this is a trough. The up direction is a peak, whereas the low direction is a trough in the case of shear waves. So what's the velocity? What's the unit of velocity? Is meter per second. And the wavelength itself gives me meter. Wavelength is measured in meter. The SI unit of wavelength is meter, whereas the SI unit of period is second. Period is measured in time. The reciprocal of period 
is what we call, let me ask someone, what's the reciprocal of Peru? Abdullah Rawahi, are you listening to me? Abdullah Rawahi. Yes, Dr. So. What's the reciprocal of period? What's one over the, the period? The time consumed for one 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 circulation. What's the what's the physical name of that thing? Uh, oh, okay, no problem. Anybody can volunteer? Frequency? Yeah, that's frequency. The reciprocal of period is frequency. The frequency is actually one over period. It's, uh, it's minute of cycles per second. How much cycle per second? That's the unit of frequency. So it's actually measured in Hertz. It's measured in Hertz. So how I can get velocity of wave? Velocity is simply the wavelength time the period. Because the, oh uh, no, divided by period or time frequency. Wavelength divided by period gives you the velocity. And as we know, change in distance over change in time is velocity. This is what we call actually group velocity. There is in geophysics something else called phase velocity, but you don't need to know about that right now. Those things are very simple. Actually, this equation, the one you see here, is the first or simplest equation in geophysics. Anybody starting studying geophysics, he will encounter the first equation in geophysics, or especially in seismology, in, in seismological studies, and seismic techniques, this particular equation, which is V equals uh, lambda, wavelength times frequency. There are some parameters of a wave, seismic waves specifically. They have an amplitude. The amplitude is the height from stationary point to the maximum disturbance, or maximum crest. This is crest or trough. Crest is the highest or maximum uh, peak. This is the crest. Usually the wave itself have different peaks. What's the highest peak and what's the lowest peak? Wave is not a single sine wave with one frequency and one speed. Wave frequency when it's moving is changing too. It's made up of different frequencies usually. So we have frequency as well. We talked about the frequency by which the wave travels. Frequency is actually what is the number of cycle passing a point in the wave in, in the unit of time, in one second, probably. So since there is a crest or a peak, there is also a trough. And we already know what is a wavelength. And finally, there is a velocity, the velocity by which the wave travels in certain direction. So this is the first equation. Uh, it's exactly from the book of uh, seismic velocities. It's a product of what frequency times wavelength. But how we can generate these dis disturbances, how we can generate uh, these uh, waves, we need to create them ourselves or we let the earth itself create them. The strongest type, strongest type of waves are actually generated from earthquakes. Volcanoes also, also can create uh, earthquakes or uh, seismic waves, explosions, any type of explosion can generate seismic waves. The first ban treaty of uh, mass destructive weapons made between US and uh, former Soviet Union was actually made or made being possible through seismic technique. 
right now how they can tell that the north uh, what they call the country north korea yes how they can tell that the north korea is doing nuclear tests they don't have access there they don't they can't go and observe what's going on they usually can tell from seismic studies when i was doing my phd i was having uh, a friend a college sitting close to me his study his study is all based on studying explosions or uh, nuclear tests whatever country is doing nuclear test even if the test is made in north korea the equipment we have in oman they can detect them So these are usually of large uh, energy. Earthquake, the seismic waves generated from earthquakes, they are really the largest. They can prove all the earth. The earthquake happened in Japan, it can be detected in Oman. We might, as a human, we cannot feel it, but the instruments, they are very sensitive, the recording instruments, can record them, can register them. Apart from that, there are also man-made equipments we use to generate seismic waves. The simplest one is a hammer. You see this guy is raising a hammer, hitting it to the ground. The objective in this case is to uh, do a seismic refraction survey, a survey called seismic refraction. In land survey, exploring for hydrocarbon, we use something called viprosize. This is a viprosize. It has a plate, and the plate will be attached to the ground and start shaking, start sending vibration to the ground. It's not damaging the ground. So as I, see, I, say, as, uh, I said before, there is... Uh, no plastic deformation it's all elastic nature the wave is moving in elastic nature what's a plastic plastic whenever you make a change in the rock the rock the change i can make in the rock is a fault a fault whenever it's generated in the rock it means that the energy is lost. The energy you created is lost breaking the rock. The majority of the energy might be converted to the state of change in the rock, which is expressed as a break, as a fault in the rock. In the seismic acquisition for oil industry, we, will not, we are not trying to break the rock. We are, our objective is send the energy and let it get back to the surface so we can detect it, we can record it. Once it's moving into the ground, it's collecting information. The time it takes to travel and return back tells us something about the velocity of the waves and the velocity of the waves is an intrinsic property of the rock itself through which i can tell the rock type the rock properties in the marine survey we don't use vibrations we use something called air gun air gun releases high pressure air in very short time period in inside the water so what i put it inside the water i compress high volume of uh, air into this uh, what's called air gun and release it suddenly and sometimes we use dynamite so this is a dynamite explosion they place the dynamite in small borehole and explode uh, make a, an explosion the dynamite is not user friendly, whereas the Viper size is more user friendly. You have more control. If you make a mistake using Viper size, you can repeat your shot. You can repeat uh, the same 
uh, acquisition at least whereas the vipro size is quite expensive in oman whenever you are trying to use vipro size you will find police is also escorting you police is behind you and they used sometimes i believe long time ago they used vipro size and the time when, whenever they are using vipro sizes police is escorting them so how i can detect the velocity of waves how fast they move in the rock and what determines the velocity what is the parameters i can use to determine the nature of the velocity in the rock it actually can be determined through two things things you probably have studied in physics one of them called the stress the other one is strain stress is actually the force you apply to something whenever you try to change something that thing or the force you are applying is called the stress whereas the strain is the accompanied change whenever you are applying uh, the stress there might be an associated change in the rock that change i call it strain so the unit of measurement of stress is actually force over area that's a force over area it's basically called stress so the contact area is important how much if i'm pushing my hand again against a bigger area or smaller area stress is different so i'm pushing on for example let's say this hard disk I'm not sure are you able to see it let me change the view so i see myself instead of the slides uh, yeah it's clear so this is my hand i'm pushing it against this uh, hard disk so the cross section area is bigger so the stress is probably smaller than the total stress if i'm not increasing my force is smaller whereas if i press against let's see yeah um, let me do something here yeah this one i'm afraid that this will leak out this is a cup mug so if i press it the cross-sectional area is smaller i'm pressing with the same force so stress is a, is what higher in this case the stress is higher because the cross-sectional area is smaller let's measure it in terms of pascal what's pascal is kilogram times uh, or divided by meter times second cubed meter times second cubed otherwise on the other hand there we have a strain strain is the change you make if i have an a rubber elastic rubber i extend it i made a change in the rubber so from its initial state to the maximum stage how much change have been accompanied that's actually what we call strain um i would like to give you an example if i have a root for example there is a simple root like that if i extend it i extend it by let's say one centimeter I extend it by one centimeter so what's the strain in this case is that small extension one centimeter by whole its original stay, uh, length small extension by the original link so strain amount usually is very very small and most scientists they agree that whenever there is a stress there is probably also strain whenever you try to make some change in the rock there is also some strain whenever i push this hard disk firmly i might not observe the strain there is very 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 slight strain i'm not being able to see it but actually there is small change in automatic atomic scale that's what we call a strain and what the how uh, how the velocity changes what's the relation between velocity and these parameters strain and strain the strain of a 
stress of a strain, stress of a strain gives me something we call elastic modulus. These two gives me something called elastic modulus. And the velocity of seismic waves, they depend on elastic modulus. I'm only concerned about this area, the elastic range. The elastic range is the area where there is still no break in the rock, no fracture in the rock or no fault in the rock. Once I ex exceed the stress of the rock, when I exceed the stress, for example, of this pen, there is still, it's going back. I'm seeing very small deflections, but it's going back, returning back to st its stage. I haven't yet exceeded the stress of this pen. Whenever I make a break in the rock, it means I ex uh, exceeded or went above the limit of the stress of this pen. And that's what happened during an earthquake. During an earthquake, actually, there are two plates, two tectonic plates. I believe you know already what are tectonic plates. They are moving against each other. They are moving in transform fashion, compressional fashion. They are moving against each other or moving apart from each other. Whenever they're moving each other, uh, toward each other, there is a stress. Stress getting accumulated, getting accumulated day after day, year after year, until a point where the stress is so high, I exceed the elastic range, the rock breaks. The rock creates a fault. I made a change, a huge change in the shape of the rock. The rock will not rebound back to its initial stage. That's a, what I call elastic range. So what are the elastic modulus? What are the different elastic modulus? The one I know, for example, if if I have uh, this block and I start extending it, what's my force? My force is the force I apply on this cross-sectional area. That's W, W times W gives you the cross-sectional area. Area of square is time of its length, double of its length. So this is the stress. And what's the change I made? The change is uh, the final change or the delta L, that's the delta L divided by its original state, original length. So if I use these two terminologies, stress over stress, or stress over strain, in this specific case, this is called the Young modulus. In this case, it's called Young Modulus. We have also Bulk Modulus and we have Shear Modulus. So Young Modulus is anything associated with change in length. Change in length is anything, anything uh, associated or Young Modulus is anything whenever I try to make a change in the length. Shearing Modulus, I try to change the shape, but keep the volume the same. That's what we call shear modulus. Whenever I try to change the shape of some material, I'm exerting a shear stress. And the model it, modulus itself is called shear modulus. Whenever I try to change a volume of something, the parameter then is called bulk modulus. And this is how it's calculated. It's force over of these two areas, W times L, over the change. The change in this case, at least simple case, is tan theta. What's tan theta? Tan of this theta 
is simply uh, opposite over over adjacent. That's the adjacent opposite over W. This is W as tan theta. And this is the theta. Whereas in this case, in the bulk modulus, I'm changing the volume. Changing volume, I'm compressing the rock or whatever is it, a, a fluid, for example. I'm trying to compress it. So I'm creating a bulk modulus. So changing volume over the original volume. In this case, the stress is a pressure. The pressure, we call it confining pressure. Why it's confining pressure, at least in this case, uh, whenever the pressure is the same from all, is the same from all direction, that's what we call confining pressure. The pressure from one direction is similar from, for, uh, for the pressure in a different direction. It gives you what we call confining pressure. So may I ask you a question? What is the shear stress in water? What is the value of shear stress in water? I would like to ask uh, Asad Al Hinai. Asad. Yes, doctor. So my question is actually, what do you think about the amount of shear stress or shear modulus? in water. I rephrase my question. How much effort do you have to make to change the shape of water? Uh, I think it will be a uh, little. How much little? Do you need to change, to, do you need actually to exert any force to change the shape of water? No, uh, change the container. Or... Yes, change the container. So you are, uh, uh, yourself, you are exerting anything? No. So what's value for nothing? <laughs> zero. Zero. So stress is zero for the case of water. Water does not have or any fluid, air does not have shear stress or shear modulus. Bulk modulus for the, uh, for the um, air or water is way, way lower than liquid materials. So I need to make more compression in a rock compared to air, for example, to make the same change. So I need, for example, if I compare a rock to some water, I can easily compress, make a change, uh, compress, change in volume of water compared to volume of rock. I need to exert more pores in the case of rock compared to the case of fluid, let's say water. Fluid is compressible, air is highly compressible. That's what we call bulk modulus. So if I go back to my slides, that's really good answer, Asad. Who, who answered me? Asad, I think. Yeah, a shear modulus with a water is nothing, is zero. So how I can relate them to velocities? The two velocity types we are concerned at least in this book is P wave and S wave. Primary, which is compression and dilatation, and which is trough and peak. Compression and dilatation, we call it P wave. P wave. S wave or shear wave is usually associ associated with trough and peak. So P wave, the particles, they move in the same direction as wave propagation. So it's wave is propagating in this direction, the particle will move like that, back and forth, back and forth. Whereas in the case of S wave, 
the wave within the rock is moving up and down in the direction of wave propagation. So S wave, can I measure S wave in water? Ibrahim Al-Manai, Al sorry if I pronounced your family name wrong. I have two Ibrahim, Ibrahim? Okay, sure. Yes, doctor. So is there any S wave? Can I measure S wave in liquid? My question mm. was... No, I think. No, yes, that's true. So there is no S wave in liquid because the shear modulus, you see shear modulus is zero. The shear modulus itself in liquid is zero. The P wave depends on these two parameters, bulk, bulk modulus and shear modulus. These two things. This is shear modulus, bulk modulus. They also depends on the density of the rocks. They also depends on the density of the rock. So P wave is calculated as such. That's the equation or the formula of the P wave, whereas the S wave formula is way simpler. It's just square root of shear modulus over the density of the rock. So since I cannot shear what I cannot tear apart water, I don't need to exert any force to change the shape of liquid. There is no S wave traveling in water but there is P wave traveling in water because P wave is uh, depending on bulk as well as shear modulus. I ask you a question, Joeria. Yes. So Joeria, my question is saying, uh, if I increase the density of some rock, let's say this is the density of the rock, it's a rock, it's hard risk, assume I'm, it's a, a rock. I increase its density. What happens to the velocity? Either S or P? It will decrease. Mm. Who agrees with Joeria? Are you all agreeing with Joeria? Doctor, it should increase. It should increase. Why is that? Because uh, density is inversely proportional to speed. To speed. Yeah, if I increase it, this if I increase this value mathematically based on this equation, if I increase the P value or the row value, velocity will decrease. That's what Joeria said inversely proportional but when i increase let's assume i'm having this rock i increase its density what happens to the compressional stresses compressional or uh, all the stresses will it be easier for me to shear it this is shearing will it be easier for me to shear it or more difficult if the density is higher? Difficult. More difficult. Difficult, yes, more difficult. Is it then easier for me to compress it, bulk modulus? No, it will be more difficult for me to compress it. So if there is an increase of density, there is high increase in what? In bulk and shear modulus. So that small increase in density will comp compensate or bring high change in bulk and shear modulus. And therefore, the velocity, either P and S, they will increase dramatically. Yeah, that's true, Maram. Maria, I'm sorry. So even though um, the equation shows that the velocity is supposed to decrease, but the density of a rock, if it increases, the rock gonna be harder. 
the rock gonna be tougher will not be easier to make a stress or make a change in the rock giving given the same stress you need them to exert more stress if there is more stress it means that there is higher velocity because stresses usually are associated with moduluses bulk modulus shear modulus there are other moduluses uh, apart from the one i showed you but they are not of uh, much interest to us as a geophysicist and there is another one called poison's ratio i just removed it so what are the wave types what are the different geophysical wave types they they are actually categorized into two different types the one the first one they are called body waves why we call them body because they travel in the interior of the earth usually they travel beneath the subsurface and they have good characteristic is that the frequency is higher they have high frequency content but they have low amplitude their amplitude is low this is characteristic for both p wave as well as s wave p wave are primary wave they are compressions within the rock the wave direction or wave propagation direction is parallel to the particle motion direction the particle moves in the same way as the wave is moving so here i'm seeing what a compression uh the animation shows me that the compression is traveling in the same way as the wave uh, direction of propagation of the wave and that's the particle motion direction this is what we call a p wave and whenever you write p wave in geophysics you have to write it in this way p dash wave it's one word oops sorry my writing is bad whenever i use my mouse but this is how it's supposed there is so must be a dash it's one word or otherwise just write it primary wave as you see here there is another body wave type which is called s wave s wave is second is not the fastest what is the fastest the what is the first to arrive to a recording station is the p wave p wave is actually the fastest wave s wave is the second to arrive it can either move up and down or side to side the particle motion direction up down if they are up down i i should or annotate the wave as s sub v vertical or it can travel side to side the particle motion direction once they are propagating is side to side they are actually the second to arrive the second wave type to arrive to a station usually is s wave types there are other wave types we call them surface waves surface waves we call them surface wave because they don't travel in the interior of the earth they only travel on the surface on the first one to two kilometers they don't go very very deep into the earth they don't have these characteristics they are very destructive the shaking we feel from earthquake and the damages uh, created because of an earthquake are actually made by this type of waves especially the riley wave is very destructive type of wave the most damage during an earthquake are associated to riley waves the surface wave there are two types and they are named because of the people who discovered them for love was a name of a guy riley is also a name of a different guy who discovered this wave type type long time ago they are very very high in amplitude 
and their uh, energy is high they can make great change in the rock but their frequency is low is frequent they have low frequency content the speed is way way lower than the speed of body waves p and s waves they are way after the body waves love wave is the third to arrive and first one is p then secondary wave then love wave and finally riley wave if i want to image them make them simple i get a root or uh, this is the one so body waves is simply i'm moving in one direction and i'm making change so this is the particle motion direction while I'm moving in one direction. This is how P wave travels. Whereas S wave, I'm traveling in the same direction, but moving this ring up and down. That's how the S wave travels, the particle motion direction. Then comes the Riley wave. The Riley wave is almost you are driving your car in one direction and rotating this one continuously. The ring, you are rotating it continuously. That's how the Riley wave travels. And how much you are moving it, how much the, the diameter of this ring is, is dependent on how you are close from the surface of the Earth. So if you are closer, you are touching the surface of the Earth, this ring is bigger. And if you move down, the ring, the ring size will decrease and decrease and decrease. Till a point where there is no Riley wave at all. And that's the reason they call them surface wave, because they only travel on the surface of the Earth. As you see here, where is my mouse pointer? So as you see here, those rings are decreasing in size. This is how the Riley wave travels. Finally, the love wave is almost similar to S wave, up and down or side to side, that's S wave actually. But the characteristic here is that the ring sizes, the, the amount of change you make is decreasing as you go deeper. So as you see here, the amount of change is decreasing as we go deeper into the interior of the Earth. Similar to, uh, sorry, surf, uh, uh, S wave. Those are type of waves, different types of waves. We record them in seismic stations. Whenever there is a record of seismic stations, we always record different types of waves. And that's how we found that there are different types of wave of, uh, from an earthquake or from seismic experiments. But how we record them? What's the instrument we use to record them? We use either seismographs or geophones. Geophones are simple instruments. They are not expensive. Those are the one we have in our department, actually, and also the one used in exploration, oil exploration. Seismograph, they are more expensive. They are the one used in seismological ex uh, experiments or seismological studies. Earthquake Monitoring Center, not sure whether you heard of it, but in Twitter, sometimes you will find that there is a center earthquake or a, or a um, center, we call it earthquake monitoring center in SKU itself is tweeting about recent earthquakes in Oman. So they use seismographs because they have to be very sensitive. Geophones, we are just recording something very close. But uh, for seismographs, we are trying to record Earthquake happened in far, far uh, large distances away from us, away from Oman, even on the other side of the world, in Himalaya, in you name it. So we need very, very sensitive uh, equipment and we call them seismographs. Geophones are used for exploration, 
uh, in investigation. Purposes is, for example, knowing the depth to bedrock, thickness of a bedrock or soil layer. There is a soil layer, usually unconsolidated layer. You want to know how much thick is that layer, you can use seismic refraction. And in that case, you simply need geophones. So geophones are actually sensitive to change in velocity or displacement. You, you need to record change in displacement of the surface or the velocity change in the surface. Whereas uh, in the marine, there is no displacement. You cannot record directly displacement. So we need something else. We need something which is sensitive to change in pressure. And what's pressure? What's, uh, what's the modulus which is usually associated with pressure change? Let me ask someone. Shamsa Jabri, are you following along? Shamsa, can you write? You can write in chat if you are not have or are having a problem with your mic. What is the pressure? Oh, sorry, actually, what is the modulus which is associated with change in pressure? Who can answer me? Anybody? Anybody can answer me? We talked about different types of modulus. Bulk models? Bulk models, yes. That's true, bulk modulus. So bulk, uh, bulk modulus is associated with change in pressure. And that's the reason we use hydrophones. And the hydrophone can then record only P wave. They cannot record S wave. Riley wave and love wave, they can travel in, in marine, in liquid. And seismogram, actually, we are recording the arrival times. If we made a disturbance, we record how long it takes for the disturbance to arrive. We are recording the time, and we are also recording the amplitude. Amplitude tells us something about how strong was the explosion. How strong is the explosion is determined by the amplitude. The higher the amplitude, it means there is more energy associated with the explosion or with the source. You use a bigger hammer or you use uh, someone um, who is more stronger than me, probably, and hit the ground. The energy generated then is higher. It will create higher amplitudes. And usually those equipment, they are uh, dumped. They are dumped. What is dumping? So if I make a disturbance in something, it will keep moving forever. You know that. If, I'm, if I have, for example, a pendulum, if I raise it up and maybe let it move, you will find it's moving up and down forever. More, maybe I finished my recording after two minutes, and I want to make another recording. This is still moving. This is still moving. So the second recording will be contaminated from the first recording. To make this one to, to stop moving, they make dumping. They make dumping. So dumping will stop the oscillation. It will let it move a stop. So I can make a different record. Maybe there is an earthquake happened and you measured it. And after like a few minutes, there is another earthquake coming and you don't want this one to keep moving forever. To stop this oscillation, I don't want the oscillation. I want the first energy. The first energy I recorded, that's it. So I need to dump, dumping, use dumping. Oil is very old-fashioned, actually, technique. They are using capacitors nowadays. 
uh, it's advanced technique. They are using magnet within coil. There is a coil surrounding a magnet. So whenever the earth is shaking, I put all my system or the phone within the ground. I touch it within the ground. And the magnet is suspension, in suspension case around a coil. The coil will move and I create an electric current. I store that electric current. The amount of uh, voltage created is proportional to the amount of velocity or amount of displacement. And to stop this magnet to move forever, they create some capacitors or some something. I'm not electrical engineer, uh, so I'm not very familiar exactly how work, how the capacitors on these things works. But the fundamental uh, conception is that I'm having a coil surrounding a magnet or the advanced or new instrument. This is just uh, very, very old techniques. They were used in 1980s, not 90s, 80s. And usually we want to record Earth itself is a 3D. Earth is a 3D. Someone is writing something. Ah, someone is asking a question. What is the bulb? This is the bulb. That's the one. So this, it can move. Whereas the frame itself is attached firmly to the ground. So whenever there is a movement, the bulb actually measure, uh, mentioned in the book. Did I mention it somewhere here? No. Good, that's thing you mean you are reading the book. So this is the thing which moves this small bulb. It keep moving whenever there is a shaking. Um, whereas this is attached to the frame. The idea is that how I can measure if I'm, let's assume that I'm an apparatus or a, a Jew phone. How I can measure something which I'm moving with. How I can measure it when I'm moving with the shaking. So I make a bulb. Bulb will not move. Whereas the thing, other things will move. Bulb is stationary. The frame will move. I start recording. But the frame, when it stops, the bulb start moving. This is the oscillation I want to discard. The oscillation continuous oscillation can be discarded through uh, dumping. For example, for simple, this simple case, I, instead of making it like on the air, I make this bulb, put it in, in some type of fluid. Oil. Oil will create some type of resistance and eventually the bulb will stop before, before another record will come and the earthquake will be passing through. As I said, since the earth is 3D, we need three different sensors in the same station. And in, in, if I want to know only the amplitude, that's fine. But I want also to know the direction from which the wave is coming. We talk that the wave has a direction and have an amplitude. Amplitude is associated with the energy it's traveling with, the amount of explosion or amount or how big the scale of the earthquake which generated this wave, or also the direction from which it's coming from. And in all Chinese uh, models, they created the seismological apparatus. The idea was actually to know from which direction the earthquake coming. So they made different frogs, frog the father. They made, they put inside them water, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, you can search it in the, in Google and find the apparatus. The idea was, if the shaking is from this direction, the wave is coming from one direction, one of the frog will spit some water in the same direction. So why we need three different sensors? 
because the earth itself is 3D. If I go back, this is how I'm measuring the amplitude. This is how I'm measuring the amplitude. This is a bulb, a spring. This will measure what ground motion, vertical ground motion. It start recording the vertical ground motion. Maybe the wave have is coming from horizontal direction, not from below. So how I can record that part? I need another apparatus in this direction. And the spring is horizontal right now. So it will measure this direction. At least I need three. And if I want to measure the complete wave direction and amplitude, I need to have to make them perpendicular. I have to make them perpendicular to each other, orthogonal directions to each other to measure the complete wave direction and wave amplitude. Since if the wave is coming from this direction and my spring only moves in this direction, the up and side direction, this G-phone will record nothing. Even though there is a disturbance, there is a wave coming through, but this one will record nothing at all. The reason being this only can measure up and side or up and down direction movement, the spring. Whereas I need a 3D or three different sensor in the same location, in the same station, which are orthogonal to each other to measure the complete 3D motion or uh, the sense of motion within the wave, the amplitude as well as the, uh, the direction. And you can tell even what's the advantage, then you can tell the wave type, not by speed, because the first one which arrives to you is the P wave, the second is the S wave, then love wave, and finally the Riley wave. But from the movement the direction, yani, the how it's moving, you can tell, oh, this is a P wave or S wave. You have three different records. This record, this record, and finally the one you have here. Three different records showing some traces, some, so if I draw it somewhere here. So this one gives you one record. This one gives you another record. And finally, this one gives you the third record. So you compare them. The good geophysicist, he can use these three waves and can tell the wave type. Oh, this is SP wave. I'm seeing it here and here and here and so on. Whereas only using one, it might be difficult for you to record uh, which wave is coming. Why is that? Let's assume I'm having my instrument in this direction. That's how it's the spring moves only in where my hand is oriented. And the wave prop propagation direction is that. The wave is coming from here. That's the wave movement direction. The earthquake happened somewhere here. Somewhere here, the earthquake happened. So the P wave moves in the same direction, but push and pulls. The P, P wave will not be recorded. The P wave will not be recorded. Why? Because the spring only sends in this direction, the motion which comes in this direction. Whereas the S wave can move in this direction, up and down so the s wave s wave will be recorded if you have only one and that's the reason you need another one and three full three so you can easily distinguish between the wave types and nowadays actually in seismological studies all the sensors are three or all the station seismic stations they have three different sensors 
Any questions? Is that clear to you all? And that's how the record shows. This is what we call a seismogram. The record itself is called seismogram. The equipment is called seismograph. These things are seismographs. Seismograph include anything which record waves, geophone, seismometers, whatever, accelerometers, uh, broadband techniques. You don't need to remember all of these, but these are all seismographs. Some of them are very expensive, very advanced. Some of them, they even cost um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. The final record from an earthquake usually looks like something what you see here. So the first arrival is P wave. You see its amplitude is quite low. Then after some time, you'll find S wave arrived. That's the S wave arrival. And those are the surface waves. They are very destructive, high amplitude, low frequency. You see the distance from peak to peak is quite larger than what you see here. Because uh, the distance from or the t distance from peak to peak gives you the, um, the lambda wavelength. Wavelength is also related to what? Related to period. And the period is related to frequency. And usually we'll also find some aftershock. Aftershock, whenever an earthquake, a big earthquake happens, all not all the energy will be released during the first shock. Not all the energy will be shown as the first fault. All the earthquakes actually in an initiation of faults, big faults. Maybe this fault is created and after some day, two days, one day, it will move slightly again. And that's how the seismic records look like or what we call seismogram. I ask you a question here. What happens if there is a small change, a gradual fault? There is a fault, but it's not created suddenly. It's created within a year, very slowly. Will there be any seismic waves or not? That's the question. I give this question. Let me choose uh, Wael Ajmi. Wael. Yes, Doctor. So my question again is, uh, let's assume there is a change or a fault in the rock which started to be created or initiated. But the fault is not created within minutes, within seconds, but was created in in the time span of five years. Slowly, slowly, slowly. So the fault is created within a time span of five years. Would there be seismic waves or not? I think uh, it depends. Depends on what? Um, maybe a small seismic there. Mm. So you know what is uh, an earthquake? Earthquake is a sudden, in general, the terminology of earthquake is sudden release of a seismic wave. It's sudden release of a stress. When I mean yeah. sudden, it means within seconds or few minutes. Yani, if I break something very slowly, slowly, without creating noise, no one here, if you are in home and you want to skip the room without letting your uh, brothers or sisters know that you are running away, you will close or open the door slowly, slowly, and try to escape away without making noises. 
Okay, but, but we have the microphones. It's uh, are uh, very sensitive. Yeah, they are sensitive, yeah. but they are sensitive to amplitude changes, which are quite big actually. We cannot sense them. Okay. We cannot sense them. So the answer actually is that no, there is no there, there is no wave usually. They will not generate big waves. There is no earthquake. The earthquake happens whenever the energy stored is released suddenly. So you see this point, the break point. I'm increasing the stress, increasing the stress. It's similar to if I'm having a rubber, I'm stretching it, stretching it, and suddenly there is a break. Suddenly there is a break. In that, in that case, I might uh, get uh, myself harmed. But if I do it in different way, not suddenly, there is no, no problem. Likewise, earthquake happens whenever there is a sudden release of energy. Let me see where I arrived by that point, how much slides left. Cards. Okay. Almost in the mid, uh, we covered 18 slides in two hours. So current instruments or modern instruments I explained previously are actually made or having such configuration, whereas there is a coil surrounding some magnets or the opposite. The coil and the frame, they are all attached to the ground. Uh, while the magnet can move freely. So the magnet, whenever there is a movement, the magnet will move and you know that there will be an electric current, induced electric current. They measure the electric current. The amount of voltage induced is proportional to the velocity or the displacement or the ground motion in general. Or the pressure in case of uh, 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 hydrophones in marine surveys. Nowadays, those instruments are, or especially the seismometers, are very, very ex uh, expensive too, but very sensitive. They can detect even a people moving one kilometer away from you. I did several times. I did seismic acquisitions. And the one geophones we have, they are not that much expensive. But whenever I make a recording, and uh, uh, the recording all the time were just nearby. Many of the times, actually, they were by. They were nearby the SQ, and we know that there is a, an airport also in Muscat close to SQ, and I believe you have heard a lot of the time that there is a plane flying on your. Uh, Heads. I those instruments were able to detect the movement, the movement or the flying of the airplane. And one of the times, the last year, I took the students with me in a course called Field Geophysics. I'm teaching this course again, and we went to uh, some place where the army is practicing shooting. The Oman army is practicing shooting. And we couldn't actually do any seismic acquisition. We waited, waited, waited for them to finish. We arrived there at almost 10, I believe. And we were just waiting. We thought, oh, maybe they go back by one. Let's do something else. Let's not do seismic acquisition. Let's do, for example, resistivity. We finished resistivity. It was the time to do seismic then. And of a sudden, you'll find a firing. Toof, toof. They were practice, practicing, actually, not doing actual uh, war or uh, fighting anybody. But you see how sensitive they are. Even the bullet shot made by the army, we were able to record it. It was very noisy. So uh, usually whenever there is a movement or an energy release, the energy propagates in all directions. In, 
uh, in terms of what we call wave fronts. This is a wave front. That's a wave front. We have three different wave fronts, but there are endless wave fronts. The wave, when it's moving away from the source point, the first thing it encounters a loss of energy. So its amplitude decreases as it goes farther away from the source of initiation. So there is a decrease in amplitude and energy. Amplitude are, uh, or energy are correlated to each other. But whenever as we as a geophysicist, uh, we try to investigate seismic technique, we try to image something called the ray. This is a ray. A ray is simpler thing for us. Actually, in the, in the reality, there are wave fronts. But to simplify our studies, we use rays. So the rays actually are perpendicular to wave fronts. Rays can tell us the wave direction. So if I ask you to draw some rays, you will draw it like that and say, uh, these are my wave fronts and the wave is uh, moving away from the center of wave initiation. Rays are not actual things. We just imagine them. We draw them for our purposes uh, to investigate uh, the seismology of the Earth. So whenever we are investigating the Earth and trying to make some experiments, if the Earth is only made up of one layer and one velocity, one layer and one velocity, and there is no heterogeneity within the rock, I think I need to stop. Uh, yeah, I need, I will complete this part later on. Oh, I'll complete these things later on. A few slides left. Uh, because I need to give you five minutes uh, discussion. Any Anyone have a question? Tomorrow we'll have a lab, actually. We'll start doing some, some new lab. So for the lab, actually, uh, we have two different lectures, two different labs, uh, because I believe during the lab, you might be interested in questioning me a lot, even though it's the same lab, but it's better to have it in uh, different times, two different sections. Each section is consisting of almost, I believe, 30 students. One of the section is uh, having larger number of students than the other section. However, do you have any questions so far? Is uh, what I'm saying clear? I, I try to make uh, my speaking slow, the way I speak slow. So it's going to be clear for you to follow along with me. Do you have any questions? No questions at all? If you don't have question, let me complete at least with these slides, with these two slides, because I don't want to be delayed a lot. The things we'll discuss tomorrow are a bit confusing too. So if the Earth is uniform, when I say uniform, there is no heterogeneity, uh, it means if I make an experiment, a geophysical experiment, a far, I make a source here and record the energy arriving to some point, the time it takes for the energy to travel from here to here is similar to the arrival time for this experiment. Since this distance is similar to this distance and similar to this distance and also similar to this distance. In earthquake analysis, especially earthquake analysis, we don't consider the surface distances. We consider something called epicentral angles. This is an epicentral angle. 
And all of these, all of these, they have the same epicentral angles. Then, all of these four, they have the same epicentral angle. If the Earth is uniform, the time taken from A1 to A2, or the time taken from A2 to B2, uh, and so forth, from A3 to B3, is the same. Is the same time. But that's not true. As we know, the ETH is not uniform. It's actually made of different layers. The ETH is having a similar shape to what we see here. But the ETH is spherically symmetric. We assume it's spherically symmetric in general. So the wave travels from here to here in general is the same the wave or the time it takes for the wave to travel from here to here is similar to the wave or travel time from here to here. There is not big change. There is slight, small, slight change, but in general, it's the same. So it is is eccentric. It made of different layers. That's a conception we already know. So if you make that's this analysis is actually made since long time, since like 1920s. They recorded a lot of earthquake data. And they found that the observed travel times, and if I make a lot of stations, A, B, C, and so on, and all of them, they have different epicentral distances. This is one epicentral distance. This is another one to this station, another one, and so on. This is my source. And keep recording. So I have the distance, this distance, probably epicentral distance or the surface distance and so on and this is the time i record the time and i have the distance so how much the wave takes from here to here from source to station a i record it somewhere here as a point how much it takes from here to be because this is farther away it takes another time and so on so this is a b and c this is actually what they observed yes muhtar Yes, Mokhtar, you raised your hand. Anybody raise his hand? Nobody? So this is what they observed. And they found the travel time. This is what we call travel time. This is travel time. Is curved. It's not linear. It's not linear because the Earth is not uniform, as we said. The Earth is made of different layers. And the velocity, as we go deeper, is increasing usually. And I think we just stop here. So do you have any questions? This is very simple. It's saying that the travel time is made of curved lines. I continue or make a continuous line along this because I only made three stations, but they are possible. I can make possible many uh, stations as I want. A, B, C, D, these can be all different stations. And they just record the travel times from S, from the source, to any station. 
and we'll find the observed travel time is a curved line. It's curved line because the Earth is made of different layers. And we stop here. Let me first stop the recording, and I think we are in good shape right now. Stop recording.